Hey everybody, my name is Clint Andrews and this is my video for um, Apologetics and Mass Communications course for Trinity Seminary and College of the Bible. And so the purpose of this video is to give an apologetic sermon or an apologetic lecture on any type of apologetic topic. So tonight my topic is going to be logic. And what I mean by that is um, this notion that non-believers, some non-believers and some atheists um, and other camps have that you can't um, logically have a system that believes in, in a God and, and more specifically in the Christian God and that logic can't be a basis that you use to argue for the existence of God. Um, they even use, they say it's, it's exclusive to their camp, to their um, school of thought. Atheism uses logic and reason. Uh, many other uh, different areas of non-believers um, use logic and reason to argue that uh, God does not exist. Um, but tonight I'm going to try to, as best as I can on this video, um, show that we couldn't even use logic and reasoning and have reasoned arguments if it wasn't for God. So first of all, um, we have to prove that logic shows that there's a deity of some sort. Um, and then we have to move past that. And I believe I can't just stop where we say there's a deity and, and, and think that's good enough because there's plenty of religions with deities. So then my next task would be to give a good sound, um, logical, even argument that it's the Christian God, God of the Bible. Um, and then lastly, what we're going to try to do is show an example of Jesus using logic in scripture. Um, just to give a gospel reference uh, to, to this whole idea uh, for this lecture. So the Lagos using logic. And so um, first we want to start by defining logic. And so to define logic, Webster's, even online at the dictionary, has logic as defined as reasoning conducted or assessed according to strict principles of validity. So strict principles of validity. In other words, it's logic is sensible thinking, a sensible process of thinking, a sensible way of navigating through thoughts, through processes. Um, that concludes, uh, is done in submission to strict rules. Okay. It's done in submission to these strict rules that, um, that are valid. So, the first question that, that rises for me out of this definition is what makes it valid? Okay. So again, the, the definition is reasoning conducted or assessed according to strict principles of validity. Why are they strict? Who said they're strict? How do we know that they're strict? And we don't question that they're strict. Um, you, you can know if somebody's given you a logical argument or, or thinking or processing or the reasoning why do we know that? How do we know that? Um, is it written somewhere? Are there, are there written rules like, hey, if it follows these exact words, it's logical? Um, no, it's not written anywhere. It's not told. It, it's, it's objective, though. Um, and, and so to, to further just explain what, what I mean when I'm talking about logic or, or logical arguments and reasoning, there's three main, um, what we call logical absolutes. So let's touch on those just to give us a better basis of what I'm talking about tonight. So logical absolutes. Um, the first one is the law of identity that says that things are what they are. A is a, it, it contains within itself, everything that makes it a, it just is a, Okay, so that's the law of identity. What does it identify as? It identifies that it's as itself. It is what it is. Um, the second one is the law of non-contradiction. The law of non-contradiction states that A cannot be both A and not A at the same time, in the same way, in the same sense. So contradictory statements cannot both be true in the same sense. Okay, so number one, law of identity. A is A. Uh, B, uh, number two, the law of non-contradiction. A 
cannot be both A and not A at the same time, in the same sense, in the same way. And thirdly is the law of excluded middle. A statement's either true or false. Um, this one's funny because as humans, we we forget about this excluded middle. That's actually excluded middle in logic and reasoning. I hear people say this all the time. It's sort of one of my pet peeves of um, they'll explain something to me and say, you know, it, it's like it is, but it isn't. No, that's impossible. It is or it isn't. Not it is and it isn't. Um, and so that's the law of excluded middle of statements, either true or false. Okay, so let's recap that again. Logic, sensible thinking based on valid points. Okay, then we, then we ask the question, what, what makes it valid? How do we know that it's valid? Okay, so then we talk about three principles or three um, logical absolutes. The first one being the law of identity, A is A. Number two, the law of non-contradiction. A cannot be both A and not A at the same time, in the same way, in the same sense. And thirdly, the law of excluded middle. A statement is either true or false. So now that we understand what I'm talking about when I say logic, um, and I think what most people that argue against God or argue against the existence of a deity mean when they say logic is, is adhering to these principles. Again, um, these principles are, uh, they cover a wide range. I'm, I'm explaining them like they're simple. I know they, they cover a wide range of thoughts and a wide range of different ideas that we can have. But um, for for this lecture, it's, it's plenty to know what I've described them as. Now, these logical absolutes, they're all true, but they're more than true. They're all objectively true. Um, they're not subjective. They're not my opinion. They're not somebody else's opinion. Um, matter of fact, if you disagree with these, you're being illogical. Um, and that's not a trap. That's just a fact. Um, that's just the way that truth works. That's the way that logic works. These are absolutely objectively true and accurate. Um, so within these logical absolutes, okay, so I don't want to, I don't want to go somewhere that we don't need to go, but I'm really trying to get our head around logic because that's the whole idea of this entire lecture, even though we're going to talk a little bit about Islam in a minute and talk a little bit about grace um, and a little bit about Jesus. Logic is a big underlying theme. So I just want to make sure that everybody's um, staying along with me here. So these logical absolutes, again, the one, two, three that I gave you, identity, non-contradiction, excluded middle, they all have these certain properties about them that make them logical absolutes. So we defined them and gave them, um, gave them a face, showed what they look like, what do they mean, but there's something that each of them contain. There's properties or characteristics of these logical absolutes, and there's three of those, three main one of those that make these logical absolutes. We can't just say they're logical absolutes. They have to be um, by certain characteristics. And the properties are conceptual, so they're conceptual, these absolutes, they're immaterial, and they're transcendent. Conceptual, immaterial, transcendent. So number one, they're conceptual. They exist only in the mind. Um, if you have a concept, you can bring that concept to fruition physically by building something or, or um, writing something or drawing something. But then it, it started as a concept, ended as a product. These logical absolutes are not a product; they're concepts only. They can only be they can only be constructed in the mind. Okay. So number two is that they're um, immaterial. Immaterial means not physical. You cannot experience these things in nature. Um, for instance, um, absolute number two that we gave the law of non contradiction. Uh, you can't experience in nature something being itself and not itself. At the same time, in the same way, in the same sense, you can't experience that nature is immaterial. Okay, conceptual in the mind only, only a concept. Number two, immaterial. They're not physical. They're not something you can grab and hold on to. And number three, they're transcendent. Um, they are transcendent. They are objectively true outside of time and space. And that sounds big, but all that means is, no matter when, no matter in in time. No matter where in space, um, these absolutes are objectively true. If human beings didn't exist, 
never walked the earth, these absolutes would still be objectively true. Um, so again, they're transcendent. They transcend time. They transcend physical space. They transcend matter and energy. Um, they always were true. They always will be true. No matter who's here, no matter what's happening, no matter what is occurring, these are true. So they're transcendent. So again, the three laws, just to recap, logic, valid, valid points. Okay. Reasoning of uh, structured reasoning based on valid points. Okay. Number one, law of identity. Number two, law of non-contradiction. Number three, law of excluded middle. Okay. Then they have properties. They're conceptual in the mind only. They are immaterial. They're not made of a material. Conceptual, immaterial, and transcendent always were, always will be objectively true. So from this, again, I started by saying that logic is something that, that some camps use to say that there is no deity, there is no God, the Christian God is not real, and that can logically prove that. But now that we've seen these logical absolutes and we understand their properties, okay, their properties are so important for this argument. Conceptual, immaterial transcendent then absolutely logic could not be a human construct what human could come up with something that is both conceptual and transcendent um being that there's never been a human being fully human being on earth that was transcendent um that's impossible so we we couldn't have established and we could have only discovered it uh, yes, naturally, humans stumbled upon these truths. A lot of smart men put their heads together and and, and um, discovered that these were true. They did not invent them. They did not construct them. They did not uh, come up with them and think that they were really good ideas and write them down. Um, they're just not. They are objective, objectively true. They're transcendent. So it's not a human construct. Um, if we as humans were to create these laws, uh, they would only be possible to be constructed within time, space, and, and, and matter and energy. So uh, once again, we are, we are within those confines. Something within a confine cannot um, construct something outside of that confine. Um, you can construct something. You can micro construct. Um, so a God could construct. He's outside of space and time. And a matter, he can construct something within time and space and matter because he created time, space, and matter. Um, so humans didn't create these laws they discovered them humans could never create something both conceptual and objective what i mean by that is something existing in the mind if it was purely human mind purely human concept that thought these things up well let's take a census of the entire of entire humanity across the board and say what do you think about a give them a point do we think that every single person would objectively agree objectively meaning there's no doubt in their mind there's not even a question things like murder is it wrong yes rape is it wrong yes that is not a subjective truth and now we're getting more into the moral argument but it, it, it follows the same um, pattern i think as the moral argument this argument for logic um, so humans can never construct something that's both conceptual and objective it would always be subjective there would always be great differences in what they think. Um, so there's not great differences in these logical absolutes. They are not subjective. They are completely objective. Okay, so I want everybody to track on me. So what I'm trying to say here is whatever it was that allowed these absolutes had to be outside of time, had to be outside of space, had to be outside of matter, some creator or deity more rightly. Um, this deity would have to be immaterial. So maybe spirit would have to be transcendent before the beginning of time, no beginning. So it can only be constructed again. Like I said, it can only be constructed by something bigger or of itself. It can be constructed by something smaller of itself into bigger macro. It has a micro construct itself. And so a deity, um, I know I'm rushing to the point. I know that I'm oversimplifying this. For the purposes of this lecture, all I'm trying to do is get some groundwork for this, really. Um, there's volumes upon volumes that could be written about this. I'm just trying to dive right in, get our, our feet wet with this, and understand 
this concept. So again, whatever was that created these logical absolutes would have to be outside of time, space, and matter. Um, but even if this, which I feel like it does, even if this provides enough evidence to prove a deity, how can I be sure, how can we be sure that this God is the Christian God, the God of Scripture, the God of the Bible? Um, so what I want to do is hone in on this concept of transcendence. I touched on it a good bit just now, but I think it's important for this lecture. Transcendence. Let's hone in on that a little while. So what was what was the point of me talking about transcendence? as it pertains to logic, was that these logical absolutes are transcendent. They're true outside of space. And I've always been true, always will be true. Um, logic in and of itself is transcendent. Um, more specifically, like I said, the objective laws. Um, we concluded that mainly due to their transcendent and objective nature, they weren't created by human minds. And therefore, the mind that did create them is transcendent. A transcendent concept. A transcendent mind. Um, so again, if we can um, borrow from Webster again, or just an online dictionary, transcendent, the definition of transcendent means exists apart from and is not subject to the limitations of the material universe. It's apart from, not subject, is not limited by m the material universe. Okay, so there's three major religions that um, claim a transcendent deity, and that is Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. So we can really narrow it down in this concept of transcendence. We can really narrow it down to those three we're talking about. It's not like we have to cover every world religion in this short lecture. Um, if we're honing on this concept of transcendence, which is our argument, because logic is transcendent, um, we can hone in on those three. All claim more or less this God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, so they all understand transcendence in this way, the same way Christians understand this transcendent creator. Um, the kicker, as we all know, between these three is Jesus Christ as the actual Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior. And so with this concept of him being the Savior um, and talking about transcendence, we're going to talk about salvation. Um, salvation, uh, more specifically, the disunity between these concerning Jesus results in the way in which one would receive salvation in Islam and Judaism. There's a work based structure. Again, I'm explaining these in the simple terms, but th there's a work based work based structure that leads to salvation. Um, in Christianity, we receive salvation through grace by faith. So there's a drawing in of us by God, the father. So um, let, let's look at Islam because grace in Judaism is a, we can push that one off aside because this we're, we're not even going to get in that um, in this discussion because I don't I don't know that grace really applies there, but there is some argument that there is grace in Islam. Um, there's talk of it. There's writings of it, and and so but but grace in Islam is really explained this way: that faith plus works warrants you all is grace. Okay, faith plus works warrants you all is grace. And ultimately, a salvation type. Um, in Christianity, though, we know that God's grace brings upon us or results in faith and then works fruit. Okay. So, again, Islam, faith plus works is your decision of faith plus your works, your fruits result in Allah giving you the grace that you need to be saved. In Christianity, God's grace first bestowed upon you and resulting in your faith resulting in the fruit which comes out in the work so grace um so what we're doing now is um just to pull us back in real quick is we're trying to we we i think we proved that a deity would almost have to be responsible not almost would absolutely have to be responsible for for our logic and logical absolutes and the characteristics of logical absolutes so now we're going, that's not good enough for this lecture. For this lecture, we want to prove that it's the God of the Bible. It's the Christian Bible, Christian God um, and that is responsible for this. So right now we're talking about transcendence. Uh, what, how does transcendence manifest? Manifest uh, through salvation and through grace. We showed that Islam, grace is faith plus works. Get you all his grace in Christianity. God's grace gets you your faith plus the fruit of the faith, which is works. 
So the grace, grace is transcendent. So if we apply transcendent definition onto grace, we can say that grace exists apart from and is not subject to the limitations of the material universe. There's nothing about grace that um, is limited by the material universe. God gives us grace. There's nothing limited about that. Um, his creation does not limit grace, in other words. But um, in Islam, talking about faith plus works gets you all this grace, um, a limitation of the material universe would be this word that we know as wages. Um, that is absolutely um, affected by the limitations of the material universe, wages. Um, so what you earn through works or what you what you earn through works would never be free and unmerited favor of God or of Allah. In this case, um, that's manifested like in Christian salvation of sinners. Um, it would be wages. It would it would be what they're obligated to give you. It would be what Allah is obligated to give you. If you have faith, you decide upon yourself within strength of yourself apart from him completely. Stir up your own faith then apply, put your hands down, put works into into it, then what you're getting is not grace. What you're getting is wages. What you're getting is what's due to you. And when you get that, there's zero transcendence in that idea. There's zero transcendence in the concept. Wages are not transcendent. Wages can be given to you by a human being, a human person. Anybody who has a job knows that. Um, this is not grace. Um but when you receive grace in Christianity, you first receive the free and unmerited favor of God. Okay, so let's let's think about that. In the Islamic structure, what you're getting from Allah by showing him your faith and your works is not grace. It's wages. You've worked to earn it. In Christianity, you earn nothing. It was given to you. And through this grace, you have faith and fruit and works. So logic we say transcendence. So we talk, hone in on this, on this concept of transcendence and say, what is transcendent? Grace. Well, then in, in, by that definition, Islam has no grace. Allah has no grace. Allah just gives you wages. So the only transcendent means out of the three major religions that show or that claim a transcendent uh, deity, the only one that has a transcendent deity that works through transcendent means as such as grace is the Christian God. This is my argument for the deity being the God of the Bible. And so logic, um, properties, absolutes of logic, properties of these absolutes, how does it manifest transcendently, manifest transcendently through grace? Who's the one to do that? The one that we know as the God of Christian scripture. And lastly, uh, I just want to touch on Jesus, or like I said at the beginning of this lecture, the Lagos using logic. Um, there's this one story in, this, in, in the Gospels that talks about the Sadducees who did not believe in the resurrection. They were the type to say um, the resurrection is illogical. And if anybody believes this, um, they're illogical. And there's no way that you can prove the resurrection using logic and reason because it is, in fact, illogical to think so. So we're going to read a, um, a section of scripture here. It says, the same day Sadducees came to him, came to Jesus, who say that there is no resurrection. They asked him a question. They said, teacher, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died. And having no offspring, he left his wife to his brother. So to the second, the third, on down to the seventh. After them all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. But Jesus answered him, you're wrong, because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for, and as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. So what happened here is that the Sadducees tried to trap Jesus in a logical trap. 
um, known as a destructive dilemma. And what a destructive dilemma does is say, hey, we're going to start with this basis that your argument is wrong because it's illogical. So we know that. So it's almost like a um, let's show Jesus up. Um, He's illogical. He's wrong before he even starts. But let's toy with him a little. What we're going to do, we're going to give him this scenario. okay? and we're going to ask him what the outcome is, no matter which way he answers. It can't be right because the question we're asking is not even logical. It's what he believes is not what we believe. The question itself and the situation we're presenting to him is an impossible situation. Any answer will be wrong. Any answer will be illogical, a destructive dilemma. Uh, because if Jesus would say, their thing is, if Jesus would say that she would be married to all seven, then um, he's violating the rules of, monog- of monogamous marriage. Okay, so he can't do that. Um, and if he says that she would just be married to one in particular, then it's arbitrary. Is he choosing at random? Then he would have to qualify that choice. Okay, um, there would be some kind of great explanation as to why that one out of the seven was chosen to be her husband in the resurrection. Uh, so no matter what his answer was, the Sadducees were excited to see him uh, crumble and see him fall on his face. But Jesus was not at all trapped. Um, for Jesus, the resurrection is truth. He knew it as truth. And truth is always on the side of logic. Logic and truth always fight together. Um, They cannot fight apart. But what the Sadducees didn't realize that they had done or what they were doing was that they made an incorrect assumption and applied it as truth. So they assumed that they were correct. They were, in fact, false. They assumed that the resurrected would be married. They didn't believe in the resurrection, but they assumed that the resurrected would be married. Jesus says, no, they're like angels in heaven. So... What Jesus did there is what's known in, in um, some logical um, jargon and, and philosophy is known as a tertium quid. What that means, a tertium quid, is what Jesus used in that argument, which means it was not the false A, number one, um, she'd be married to all of them. Not the false B, she'd be married to just one of them. But in fact, it was the true C. Um, so we would just say it was the right answer. But in the whole context of the story, it was the tertium quid. It was the third choice, the correct third choice. Um, The first two choices were illogical. The third choice was correct and logical. Um, The Sadducees committed what we call a logical fallacy. Okay, logical fallacy. Um, They were logically false. They were logically missed the mark by a shot, by a long shot. Uh, Jesus then goes on to show them how weak their argument actually was by reminding them of a scripture that they are no doubt familiar with, which is Exodus 3, 6, which states that I am the God of your father. I am the uh, the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. So if what the Sadducees were claiming is true, that the souls die with the bodies and Abraham, Isaac and Jacob are actually dead and not alive, then God is the God of the dead. He was their God. Um, He no longer is for their dead. He cannot present tense, I am, be any person's God. He would not be the I am. He would be the I was. Um, So Jesus ended that argument by showing them, look, you were way off base logically. Um, You created a fallacy. And not only that, you don't even understand scripture. You don't even understand the power of God. So tonight we looked at logic, we defined logic, we talked about its properties, we talked about, um, remember their objective, transcendent, conceptual, to be transcendent and conceptual would require a transcendent concept, a transcendent mind, Um, this mind is a God, more specifically um, the God of the Christian Bible as as we showed through his transcendent means of grace as understood through scripture, and lastly we looked at the Logos, we looked at Jesus at just one example of how Jesus used this concept in his earthly ministry and used this concept to further the kingdom of God and help um, people with the understanding of the kingdom of God, the power of God, and the meaning and power of Scripture. So I hope that helps. I hope you guys enjoyed this and understood it. Thanks.